Yesterday, I had a conversation with my friend Melissa. She is professor of economics in the University of Utah. She challenged me to prepare and share with her a video about neuroeconomics and how people make decisions. It seems that she watched the video in the channel about that matter and loved it. That's the reason today we are filming the first video in English in the history of this channel. I hope you enjoy it. While the economic utility according to the classic economics, is mainly rational and individual. Neuroeconomics, or behavioral economy, introduced the concepts of bounded rationality and common wellness. This way, they explained the unorthodox agents choice theory that neuroeconomics represents. Regarding common wellness, the reformist utilitarianism in Britain in the 19th century by Bentham, Stuart Mill, and Sir Edwin Chadwick argued a concept of collective utility that advocated the decisions of people in favor of common happiness, not only individual satisfaction. Under this idea, the English reformists achieved, for instance, reducing the dramatic death toll of cholera in London. If we talk about bounded rationality, already in the 20th century, George Catona stated that the Perfect market conditions portrayed by classic economics only happen in rare occasions and, and that the context of economic decisions is generally spontaneous and sentiment dominant instead of rational. Tversky and Kahneman described in their prospect theory a decision sequence where heuristics produced by biases like framing effect or loss aversion play a key role in the end choice. They also identified other relevant biases in the decisions process, like representativeness, availability, or anchoring. Unlike a classic economics, prospect theory demonstrated that people decide based on the reference they have and not maximizing the utility in a perfect supposed market. For instance, if your close friends or your personal experience tell you that the usual price for a good is X, that is the first place you will use as a reference to estimate expensiveness or cheapness, independently of the market price. Simon, considered the first behavioral economist honored by a Nobel Prize in 1978, projected a choice theory based in an organizational context of asymmetric information where the agents make their decisions according to the limited options that they distinguish under human cognitive clear limitations. Thus, decision makers will no more be icons, but humans, in words of Richard Taylor and Cass Sandstein, for whom the calculation of utility turns out to be less rational than the classic economists would expect. Taylor and Sunstein integrated all these uh, contributions and introduced the distinction between Cognitive System 1, or automatic, and Cognitive System 2, or reflective. They argue that decisions frequently take place in System 1, where the person is primarily exposed to biases. These biases drive people to use heuristics to decide, instead of using the rational System 2. Most decisions are made using the System 1, which inadvertently guides us uh, throughout routine, avoiding dangers and following our usual habits. Dressing up, walking on the streets, using the remote control, typing, browsing on the internet, etc. It's like an autopilot. However, we call System 2 when rational decisions are required. This is the case of solving a math problem, participating in a debate, or managing significant changes. Taylor and Sunstein added the concepts of choice architecture and NATCH to neuroeconomics framework. If decision makers are subject to bounded rationality, biases and heuristics, then choice architects will have the opportunity to influence the person to find one option more attractive than the other. They will be able to use Natchez to leverage heuristic in order to drive humans towards the correct choice. That can be more beneficial than if the person 
decides on their own. The logic of Natchez applies for example when the supermarket draws a green arrow on the floor to guide you to the fresh food area. Because the excess of information in any shop, what is called the availability bias, and the omnipresent temptations of fast food and beverage, what is called the framing bias, could work to miscarriage your most correct choice. However, a simple green path triggers your system too and regards about the importance of a healthy diet in your shopping cart. Natchez opened the door for the libertarian paternalism, a similar approach to the utilitarianism of the 19th century. By this approach, the choice architect can model the context where decisions are made to obtain results more advantageous for the decision maker and the rest of our society. Moreover, Thaler and Sunstein classify Natchez according to this word, using it as an acronym. So we have six different nudges to be used to influence others' decisions. Incentives, understand mapping, defaults, key feedback, expect error, and structure complex choices. For example, when the public administration recommends people to save for their retirement, they can provide short-term fiscal benefits, what would be incentives, implement calculators to estimate their future income, mapping, automatically opting employees for saving programs, defaults, inform them periodically about their expected retirement fund balance, feedback, send reminders to all the 45 years old citizens, expect error, or present them three main options to save structure. It's true that Terms like correct or advantageous are tricky because they get into the ethical and individual realm. Nevertheless, neuroeconomics affirms that nudges must not be coercive nor costly. These would be the two essential conditions to actually call it a nudge. Let's see other examples in your everyday life. Well, if you, like me, find all this fascinating, check all the information and links below in the description of this video to go further on it. I will be glad to receive your questions and points of view in the comments section below too. See you soon.